All right, welcome everybody. We are here uh, with an interview uh, with my friend, Mr. Jeremy Myers, who um, is at Augsburg College. Jeremy, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself real quick? Sure. Um, I oversee the Youth and Family Ministry major at Augsburg College. I've been there 10 years. Before that, I was a youth minister in a uh, church in Minnesota, a church in Indiana. I have a wife and two kids and a dog. Awesome. <laughs> So one of the things that we're talking about here in this CPL course is engaging our neighbor and you're somebody who's studied this and written about this and have done grant proposals about this and we felt like you were uniquely qualified to talk a little bit of, uh, about this. So um, I've heard you talk a little bit about um, something that really dovetails with CPL which our tagline is listen, learn, lead and you have kind of a similar framework. Could you talk a little bit about that, your framework that you have for listening to them? Sure. Um, at Augsburg, we've been working on developing um, a model that for now we're calling public faith or public church model. And there's four steps. It's sort of a cycle, which will be anyone who's familiar with experiential education or practical theology, the four steps. So in CPL, they're learning Osmer's right hermeneutic uh, is quite similar to that. So the first movement is movement into the for the first movement for a congregation or um, a ministry leader is the movement into the community to listen to the neighbor. Um, that's that uh, movement is called accompaniment, walking with the neighbor, learning to listen to the neighbor. That's the first step. The second step is interpretation, where you start to put. Um, what you have heard from your neighbor into conversation with your core beliefs and, and, and how you know and how you understand and how you experience God's story. So now you're weaving your neighbor's story in with God's story and learning how your neighbor's story might challenge um, the way you've always understood God's story and how God's story might frame or change the way you understand your neighbor's story. The third movement then is um, the movement into discernment where now you're listening for a call um, you're listening for um, how God might be calling you your community your faith community your congregation um, to respond to what you've heard so the question then becomes who is God calling us to be what is God calling us to do in light of what we've heard from our neighbor and what we hear uh, from God's story and then the fourth movement which is actually where um, Lutherans tend to like to start is proclamation. Um, we assume that's the starting place that things start with the proclaimed word. Um, but what uh, what I'm arguing for is that there's a lot that has to happen before that. Before we uh, can proclaim good news into someone's life, we have to understand their life and do the hard work of listening, interpreting, and discerning. And then we're ready for that fourth movement, which is proclamation or re-engagement, entering in, re-entering life with the neighbor with good news that's actually really good for them and not just something that we think should be good news for them. Can you think of an example uh, either in the Twin Cities or um, around the world mm -hmm. uh, where there was a community that was able to engage in this process and it actually went well? And <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, there probably are some out there. Uh, what I, I've often what I've often said about this method is that it's descriptive more than prescriptive in that by that I mean that it's trying to describe what I think people are already doing whether they know it or not um, so I imagine there are congregations that have done this but it's been hard for me to find um, examples um, where they've um, intentionally worked through all four of of those um, steps I'm just, I'm just that, imagining that it's if you, to take the long view, um, there's some challenges in doing that because what if the lights don't stay on while we're in yeah. this yeah. study of the neighborhood? Yeah. We got to get bodies and get them quick rather than being strategic. Well, that's not what this method is about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, this is really about a church sort of um, rather than rather than figuring out how to sustain the church, this is really this method is really about figuring out how a church gives itself away. Um, and unfortunately, that might mean, you know, the, the lights go off. I don't know, that sounds doom and gloom. But um, 
it, it, it's less about getting people in the pews and more about getting people out of the pews and, and deeply engaged in the, in the community where the church is situated. So, um, so there are some examples I can think of a <clears throat> church that, um, you know, uh, Redeemer Lutheran in North Minneapolis did this years ago. They did some listening in their community and they identified some um, consistent themes that they were hearing. And you can help me out. You probably know, you might know these better than I do. I know that's where you're a, a member. But it, they, it was like job training, um, youth development, and um, affordable housing, I think, were some key themes that they heard in their community. So for the last decade, that congregation's really been working on, on those three themes. Because, not because they thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we did this, but because they had done, they had spent some time listening out in their community. So I think that's an example of accompaniment, um, an example of a church that's just starting this now uh, there's a church in St. Paul that uh, is, is not right now just starting to um, gather their members, some leaders within their congregation, to start learning um, how do you ask hard questions, how do you engage in respectful dialogue, how do you listen for another person's story. Um, it, it, so they're, they're just starting out with an intentional process of training their people how to listen so that they're ready then to engage not you know it's not necessarily going door to door right that might be part of it but it could just be your co-workers right um, or the people you're already around but learning how to have respectful dialogue learning how to ask tough questions learning how to listen first um, before you um, talk you're not trying to sell something to them you're not trying to it's not it's not a process of gathering data um, so much as it is a process of actually really honoring the person who's in front of you at that moment. If, 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 if you treat it as though you're just out gathering, you know, you're doing market research, people are going to catch on to that and be resistant to it. Um, I think there are probably that phase, that accompaniment step, the first one, I think there are a lot of examples of congregations who are figuring out new ways to do that, to get out into their community and hear stories. Um, Faith-based community organizing um, will train people to do one-on-ones. The whole point of that is to learn kind of where people are at and what they're passionate about, what their deep desires are, what their concerns are. So I see that, those as some examples of accompaniment. That's good. Good, good. Um, so we're, we're, this course uh, that we're in, involved in right now is about uh, one of the big tools that we use is the IDI, Intercultural mm -hmm. Development mm -hmm. Inventory. And um, I, I think that what we're talking about has um, this idea of mission <laughs> is fraught with a lot of baggage mm -hmm. around colonialism mm -hmm. and, <clears throat> and other things. And so how do, we, um, how do we do this work that God has called us to do while not perpetuating mm -hmm. um, some of the colonialist mm -hmm. um, damage that's been sure. done. Sure. Can you talk a little bit yeah, about that? Yeah. Um, that's been a really interesting um, thing for me to wrestle with as, as I've been developing, working on this, this method. Um, how do you, how do you um, build in, or, or um, yeah, how do you build in uh, an, uh, a knowledge of privilege and power into this so that you're if we go out into our neighborhoods especially if our neighborhoods are well I would say our neighborhoods are diverse in different ways if we go out into our community without recognizing the reality of privilege and power differentials um, we can do more damage than, than good, right? Um, and so the question really becomes, and I don't have an answer for this, I just think it's an interesting question, an important one. It's a chicken and egg question, I guess. Like, it, do we need to do like the hard work of the IDI and some cultural competency training? Do we do that before we can even engage with the neighbor? Part of me thinks, yeah, we need to do that work first. Or do we need to engage the neighbor first? And, and I think maybe a larger part of me, at least today, changes. 
um, would say we have to engage the neighbor first because um, I think the neighbor calls things out of us and reveals things to us in ways that are different and more powerful than a survey. I don't want to knock the IDI because I do think it's helpful, but I think encountering a real person who you truly want to um, honor and hearing that they have a completely different life um, experience than you, I think there's something uh, salvific and liberating um, about that kind of an experience where our, and, and that's how it worked for me really was not necessarily through formal training but encounters with real people that then made, that then challenged me and, and troubled me and um, made me want to learn more. It made me want to learn what words and phrases are inviting and what words and phrases can be damaging. It made me want to learn that. It made me want to learn um, how to listen, how to bracket um, my experience as a straight white male so that I could really hear someone else's experience that would be quite different th than mine. So um, I think the work of cultural competency is an absolute must. I, as congregations move into the public square to listen to their neighbor, we're going to have to do the hard work of, of learning how to negotiate the, the reality of power differential, how to check our own privilege. We're going to have to learn how to do interfaith dialogue better. Um, so engagement with the neighbor uh, presents us with all this other work that we have to do. It's not something we can do in one hour after church. Yes. Right? And what, what you're talking about is a huge theme uh, in the work that we do, which is this idea of phronesis, this practical wisdom mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. gain from being in, engaged mm -hmm. in and doing the work. Mm -hmm. But I think maybe there's a dialectical tension between the, the things we're, the book learning that mm -hmm. we're doing, mm -hmm. and then being in relationship with people. I don't think it's an either or. I think it's. Yeah, right. It's no, I. Way. Right. And so I, uh, before I came to this interview, I was doing some writing. And um, what I say over and over again is that thinking theologically is the new practical, right? Or <laughs> Kurt Lewin, who's been uh, someone who's done some writing, uh, you know, for the last century on uh, um, social psychology and, 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 learning theory has said that there's, what, what is exact, he says, there's nothing more practical than a good theory, <laughs> you know? And so I think being able to think theologically on the fly when you're face to face with another person who has a very different life experience than you is what we need to learn how to do. Um, so it's not the theoretical and then the practical or the practical and the theological, those things happen thinking theologically is the practical skill we need to develop as leaders in ministry. And you do that pastorally in the moment. It's not a linear, you know, it's not a two-step thing. So. Amen. So I'm, I've, I've been living in the youth ministry world for a long time. And so where I've seen this stuff show up, and from you specifically, is, you know, we've done these youth gatherings for many, many years. And Part of the idea of the youth gathering is you kind of drop in, you do your thing, <laughs> you 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 go into some city, and you spend three days there. Mm -hmm. uh, you maybe go to the McDonald's, mm -hmm. and then you leave. Mm -hmm. And you and and what you did, I think it was this last one or maybe two gatherings ago. You said, "Hey, we want to go deeper with this city," mm -hmm. and um, you're like, this, "This is a place where people live, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. let's try to get to know this city mm -hmm. and, and let's be impacted by it." Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about what what that process was for you guys? Sure. Yeah. For uh, so, I was asked to write the getting ready materials for the first, most recent um, national youth gathering in New Orleans. So the one right after Hurricane Katrina, um, and um, the leadership had already made a commitment to stay in New Orleans even after Kat Katrina. They could have bailed, but they decided to stay. Um, and that was a really important move for them. And I had always been sort of critical, you know, as an outsider of the National Youth Gathering because I felt like, or any big gathering like that, because it felt like 
we were just showing up in the middle of nowhere, you know, like we'd come into San Antonio and we would use San Antonio like it was our own little sound stage, right? Like an inflatable city mm -hmm. in the middle of mm -hmm. nowhere, mm -hmm. you know? And and it always felt strange for me and I didn't really know why. Mm -hmm. And it was working on the getting ready materials for New Orleans where it sort of clicked for me. And I realized that people, people are born in this city. People get married in this city. They have babies, they make a life, they die, they're buried in this city. Um, and it's all of those kinds of experiences in which God shows up and transforms lives. And if we come into this city as just tourists using it for an amazing weekend, we miss the richness and the power of, of what the Spirit's doing. And the youth gathering team was already committed to that idea. The truth is that New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina was so fragile that there was no way we could just waltz into it the way we had been. Um, we, we had to walk more gingerly uh, and humbly into New Orleans. Um, so I think it was really a gift that New Orleans gave us. And in the process of planning those materials, I asked a lot of people who lived in New Orleans, I would say there's 35,000 people getting ready to come down here. I'm tasked with writing curriculum that will get them ready. What should I be telling them? And the people from New Orleans said, tell them to pull up a chair, sit in the shade with me, have a glass of lemonade, and let me tell them my story. They said, the, the hole in my roof with the FEMA tarp on it, that'll get fixed eventually. But let me just tell you my story. What they were most concerned with was having people hear and remember their story about what happened. Uh, and that was extremely powerful for me as a theologian, for me as someone who um, works with young people and teaches college students, just um, the, the, the opportunity for us to experience uh, how God liberates and frees people in real time, in real lives, um, would not necessarily happen in dome events, but would happen with a glass of lemonade in a lawn chair, in the shade, hearing another person's story. That that somehow is um, maybe how we're saved. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> That's probably heretical, but no, I'll, but <laughs> I'll deal with it. <laughs> the implications of what you say, I mean, are just, that can be a, an analogy, I mean, pretty much for anything that's kind of this pop-up. I mean, this mission work that we do that's, you know, there's these pop-up stores now mm -hmm. where you can go to a mall and you just pop, yep. kind of pop up. And it's similarly, there have been these missional efforts that have not had any roots at all mm -hmm. and, and just the damage that that can do versus right. Right. taking more of a long long road and, mm -hmm. and listening. Mm -hmm. And so um, I really appreciate all your wisdom and insight. Um, would you want to leave a, a nugget of wisdom for these students here or for these potential supervising pastors or mentors that um, might be helpful when it comes to to listen to the neighbor. neighbor yeah um, I think it's absolutely all about the neighbor I think um, religion the story of Christianity is a story of God in the flesh setting us free from religious tradition so that we might rehumanize the neighbor who's been dehumanized I think that's a point of religion. I think that's a point of Christianity. I think that's a point of the incarnation is not to um, save us from this world for the next, but to free us for this world to say um, the God you worship is a, re is a God who has entered into this world relationally to free you for your neighbor, to free you to love and serve your neighbor. The, uh, it, it, is a, it is Christ saying that um, this vertical, if you will, relationship between you and me, Jesus is saying, I've got that covered. So now will you please just roll up your sleeves and do what your neighbor needs. Not, not, not to please me, but because your neighbor deserves it. So as a leader preparing for ministry, I would say the essence of the church, the essence of our call as Christians, the essence of the gospel is that it frees us um, for our neighbor. And this is what I believe about people who come to seminary. That's how they want to do ministry. People who show up at seminary, 
uh, the leaders I've gotten to know at Augsburg College, here at Luther Seminary, at other seminaries um, throughout the ELCA, the thing that draws them to ministry is this desire to be engaged in the world in meaningful ways. And sometimes the business of running a church can take you away from that. And so when you start to feel like the business of running the church or the hard work of being a student in seminary is pulling you away from your desire to, to be with people, then um, do what you need to do to get back with people. Do what you need to do to get back with people because it ultimately is um, what Jesus frees us for. We're, we're entering Advent right now. Um, is Jesus the reason for the season? I don't think so. I think like our neighbor is actually the reason for the season. I think Jesus frees us not to worship Jesus. Jesus frees us not to worship God. Jesus frees us to be good news to our neighbor. So I guess I'd leave him with that. Amen. <laughs>